Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his piece, Technologies of the Self, Michel Foucault spends a, a significant portion discussing different periods, different traditions, different thinkers, and how they reconfigured or rethought out the care of the self. And he talks about these transformations that are taking place in Hellenistic and then Roman culture. And, and one of the things that he says that uh, you can sort of generalize is that in Hellenistic and imperial periods, the Socratic notion of the care of the self became a common universal philosophical theme. So it becomes part of the general culture. It becomes part of specific traditions, specific approaches within that culture, ways of becoming cultured, ways of becoming a better self, becoming who one is supposed to be. And he, and he talks about how widespread this is. Now, he mentions the Epicureans who are a non-Socratic school, but they are you know, reacting to it, and the same theme is found there. He says, care of the self was accepted by Epicurus and his followers, by the Cynics, and by such Stoics as Seneca, Rufus, and Galen. Galen, of course, is not a Stoic, but that, that's perfectly fine. The Pythagoreans gave attention to the notion of an ordered life in common. This care, the theme of the care of the self was not abstract advice, but a widespread activity, a network of obligations and services to the, the soul. And so you know, he's talking about a number of different um, movements. And you know, we've got the Epicureans, we've got the Cynics, who are a Socratic school descending through Antisthenes, or some scholars think through Diogenes. It doesn't really matter, because by the time that you know, uh, we're deep in the Hellenistic era, there's many uh, Cynics wandering around. The Stoics, definitely. Uh, who, by the way, are drawing on the cynics. Later Platonists, right? He's going to bring up uh, Plutarch. He's going to bring up Neoplatonists. They are also concerned with this. We could say Eclectics. Galen would fit in there. So would Cicero. And interestingly, he points out that Lucian satirizes this. And one way that you can tell that something has really caught on outside of like, you know, strictly philosophical circles is the fact that people are making fun of it, right? It's, it's important enough to make fun of. He also says um, it, it was an extremely widespread activity. It brought about competition between the rhetoricians and those who turned towards themselves, particularly over the question of the role of the master. And then he says, there were charlatans, of course, but certain individuals took it seriously. And you know, it's interesting if you think about it, there's charlatans, right? But you can really only have charlatans if there's also the possibility, perhaps the actuality, of the genuine article, right? So the, for, for every Diogenes, maybe there are three or four pseudo-Diogenes who are just, you know, looking for attention or something like that. But that doesn't take away from the fact that there was a Diogenes. And these are possibilities for human beings to figure out how to understand themselves, how to transform themselves, how to apply the technologies of the self. And so Foucault tells us with the new care of the self comes the possibility of new experience of the self. And you can look at Hellenistic and you know, Roman literature as you know, prime examples of, of what's going on with this, how are people now understanding the self, themselves, and the general self, 
what it is to be a human being, a fully developed human being, in different ways. Now, he talks about some important transformations. As a historian, Foucault is particularly attuned to continuities and discontinuities. Um, so some of the transformations in the, the care of the self, he outlines a little bit later. He says, um, to be concerned with the self in the Hellenistic and Ro Roman periods is not exclusively a preparation for political life. Care of the self has become a universal principle. One must leave politics to take better care of the self. And yes and no. I mean, the Epicureans definitely thought you should leave politics to take better care of the self. Cynics would get in the face of political leaders. They're doing politics in a certain kind of way. They're conceiving of themselves heralds of Zeus. The Stoics stress the need to be involved in politics and social life in a certain way to do one's you know, offices or, or duties. So we could say that, that maybe Foucault is overplaying his hand a little bit here, but definitely there is a, a new way of, of understanding uh, the relation to politics, whether it be on a you know sort of large scale or on the local level. So, the other another key transformation is it's and again maybe Foucault is being a little bit too schematic here, is that it's no longer just for the young as maybe it was for for um, Plato, right? Now it's a way of living throughout one's life. Although, you know, Socrates himself represents a certain way of doing that. And in some of the dialogues, he's discussing things with other people who are middle aged um, or even older and are, seem to be trying to live a particularly good kind of life. But he does talk a lot with the, the youth. So we can say definitely that there is, like he says, it's not obligatory just for young people concerned with their education. It's a way of living for everybody throughout their lives. Is that latent there in the Platonic thing? I would say yes. Um, he also says that self-knowledge is playing a role, the Gnothi se autu of the Delphic maxim, but it involves other relations as well. He doesn't really spell out what, what he means by that, but you could say it's not just oriented towards care of the self. Knowing oneself is starting to take on an importance uh, in its own right. And he brings up you know, some, some interesting things about the body and one's day-to-day -day life, he says, you can compare Cicero to later Seneca or Marcus Aurelius. We see, for example, Seneca's and Marcus's meticulous concern with the details of daily life, with the movement of the spirit, with self-analysis that we're not, we're not seeing in Cicero, for example. Another thing that I think is really important is um, the kind of models or paradigms that we see getting used. So as opposed to a pedagogical model that we see with Plato, and it's not exclusively a pedagogical model. It's not as if Plato doesn't uh, also talk about medicine and uh, things like that, but there is, there is a, a particularly pedagogical model, a medical model, the therapy of the self displaces and then eventually comes to replace the pedagogical model in many respects. Like he says, the care of the self isn't another kind of pedagogy. It has become permanent medical care. One must become the doctor of oneself. A doctor who's sick and who gets medical advice from other sick doctors ultimately are trying to become cured. And this leads to the next thing, preparing for a certain complete achievement of life, he says, this is something that, you know, the, the objective is no longer to get prepared for adult life or for another life, but to get prepared for a certain complete achievement of life. This achievement is complete at the moment just prior to death. Um, and he says there's, a, there's an inversion here of the typical Greek uh, views on, on youth. And, and I think there's something to this. I would say that's already there discussed in, in Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics Book 1 about, you know, do we have to wait until somebody's dead before we call them happy? So it's, it's not quite so simple as that. And you could say definitely from the Epicurean perspective, you're not just waiting for death, you're enjoying your life on the way because death is the end for Epicureans, even for Stoics, quite frankly. I mean, there's this vague notion of maybe being able to live on, 
you know, in some sort of stellar life, but that's not for most people. Um, so each of these is a transformation that's taking place. Is it as cut and dried as Foucault is making it out? Perhaps, perhaps not. Um, he does talk about new practices that are, that are quite important as well. And he says that we see the disappearance of dialogue, the increasing importance of a new pedagogical relationship where the master or teacher speaks, does not ask questions, the disciple does not answer, but must listen and keep silent. A cultivation of silence becomes more and more important in Pythagorean cultivation. Now that's going way back prior to even, you know, Socrates and, and Plato, but disciples kept silent for five years as a pedagogical rule. They developed the art of listening as the positive condition for acquiring truth. This tradition is picked up during the imperial period, and we see the beginning of the cultivation of silence and the art of listening rather than cultivation of dialogue as in Plato. And so he says, to learn the art of listening, we need to read Plutarch's treatise on the art of listening to lectures. Um, which can also mean, you know, so peri to akuen, listening, also obeying, right? At the beginning of this treatise, Plutarch says, following schooling, we must learn to listen to logos, that is reason or speech, throughout our entire life. Uh, it's crucial so that you can tell what's true and what is dissimulation, what is rhetorical truth, what is falsehood. Listening is linked to the fact that the dis dis disciple is not under the control of the masters, but must listen to logos. One keeps silent at the lecture, one thinks about it afterwards. And then he gives some other examples, you know, Philo of Alexandria talking about uh, banquets where people are, are reading and the reading is being listened to. And I, I think there's something to that. You know, we know, for example, in the way that schooling was going on, that there would be like, for example, among the Stoics, reading some Chrysippus, then the teacher comments on it. We do know, however, though, that there also was back and forth going on at other points as well. But we could say there's a, a, a practice of shut up, listen, think, take it in, and then only afterwards come back, right? Uh, examination of conscience, another big thing. And this, again, goes back quite a ways, but it attains a real significance in the, the you know, Roman period, Seneca, for example, suggesting to us that we should sort of, you know, at the, the end of the day, think, what did I do well with? What did I not do well with? Also forgive oneself for one's, one's faults. Um, examination of how one did throughout the day so as to establish not just a habit, but also a continual attentiveness to, to oneself, a review, you could say. And then there's a host of different Stoic practices that um, he describes as technologies of the self. We'll just give you know, some examples of the, this, you know, letters to friends, disclosure of self, examination of self and consciousness, right? And then escasis. But we'll talk about that elsewhere as a separate set of technologies of the self. The point is that with, between these different schools, and within Hellenistic and Roman culture, there is an ongoing reconsideration and further development of technologies of the self going beyond what Plato, Socrates, even Aristotle, perhaps in the Lyceum, were offering. And this, you know, this is bringing new things to the table, you might say, in terms of what we in the present can draw upon and say, oh, well, maybe there's something there that we could use in our own technologies of the self for our own care of the self.